Amen. Joshua chapter 5. Joshua 5. Well, you know, in the book of Joshua, there's an amazing event that takes place. And it's appropriate that we're, uh, we're in Joshua these days. Because, you know, uh, there's this thing happening tomorrow. I can't see a thing. Y'all out there? You know, in Joshua chapter, you think it's phenomenal that the moon's rotation is going to come in between us, the earth, and, and the sun tomorrow. Well, I'm going to tell you something that's even more phenomenal. <laughs> it's a miracle that took place in Joshua chapter 10. When old uh, Joshua was leading uh, the children of Israel in a, in a battle against the Amorites. And the Bible says in Joshua chapter 10 verse 13 that the sun stood still and the moon stopped. We're talking about an entire rotation of the sun and moon and earth and all of those things that I never understood. And there's people who think they understand it, but they don't really understand it because you don't understand the complex intricacies of an almighty God. But yet we understand it, but we don't understand it. But yet the Bible says the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed its setting almost a full day. Wow. So, hey, tomorrow's going to be a pretty exciting time. I hope you'll, you'll take part in it and, and uh, see a, a lifetime worth of memories on a historical event. Last time it happened that I remember, I was eight years old. That was in February of 1979. There's been partial eclipse since then, but nothing like is going to happen tomorrow. So a phenomenal thing's happening tomorrow, and we praise the Lord for it. It's all by His handiwork. Well, I, the title of the message today has nothing to do with the sun, but uh, everything to do with, well, a very awkward subject. Circumcision. I told Paul, uh, um, Paul, Carl in the back, I said, you know, it's just really great that the last Sunday that you're here, I'm going to preach on circumcision. He said, thank you so much. <laughs> Joshua 5. Y'all know that we're in a series through the book of Joshua. Some of you first-time visitors are looking at each other like, boy, this is strange. But we're in the book of Joshua on Sunday mornings. So let's read verses 1 through 9. And let's think about the truths that we can learn from this passage. And as we've said, before the battles are won, when the Amorite kings across the Jordan to the west and all the Canaanite kings near the sea heard how the Lord had dried up the waters of the river Jordan before the Israelites until they crossed over, they, they lost heart. And their courage failed because of the Israelites. And at that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelite men. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelite men at the hill of circumcision. Well, that'll bless you right there, right? <laughs> this, this is the reason Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war, had died in the wilderness along the way after that they had come out of Egypt. Though all the people who had came out were circumcised, none of the people born in the wilderness along the way were circumcised until after they came out, uh, or after they came out of Egypt. For the Israelites wandered in the wilderness 40 years until the nation's men of war who came out of Egypt had died off because they did not obey the Lord. So the Lord vowed never to let them see the promised land. He had sworn to their fathers to give us as land flowing with milk and honey. And Joshua raised up sons in their place. It was these sons he circumcised. They were still uncircumcised, still uh, since they had not been circumcised along the way, and after the entire nation had been circumcised, they stayed where they were in the camp until they were healed. The Lord then said to Joshua, key verse, Today, look at your neighbor and say, Today. Today I have rolled away the disgrace and reproach of Egypt from you 
Therefore, the place here today is called Gilgal to this day. Lord, we want to just bow in your presence and, and thank you that we can come to your throne. Lord, we thank you that every bit of your word is, is relevant to our lives. Even Old Testament passages such as this, uh, Lord, apply to us even today. And I pray that as we consider the text in context, that you would teach us great lessons. May your Holy Spirit, as this video has portrayed, challenge us and chisel at our lives and our hearts as, as we uh, contemplate what was happening here. Lord, if there's someone here that just doesn't know you, I pray that even in these moments, that even though this message is for believers, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to them and draw them to Jesus. And we'll praise you for it. In Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen and Amen. Well, you know, there were a lot of, of amazing things that took place in the book of Joshua, right? You've been reading through it. And if you've never read it before, uh, you have read some miracles that were just mighty miracles of the Lord. Such as when the Lord caused the, the Jordan River to completely stop flowing at its peak season in the spring when its banks were overflowing. Don't believe those moderate and liberal theologians who would say that the, the nation of Israel walked across the very shallow part of, of the River Jordan at a at a, you know, a time of drought. No, this, the Scripture is very clear to say it was overflowing its banks in the springtime. And they saw the miracle of the Lord stopping uh, the, the, the river from flowing all the way from Adam southward, some 15-mile track that the, the children of Israel crossed over into the promised land on dry ground. And if you've ever never read that before, you read that and you say, Wow, what a miracle. And then you know that we're going to be in that passage here shortly, but the Lord had the children of Israel to walk around that ancient fortified city, Jericho, for seven days as a battle plan. <laughs> and then on the seventh day, they were to walk around it seven times, blow their trumpets, and everyone shout to the Lord that God had given them the victory and the walls of Jericho came down and the Jews rushed in and began to slaughter the inhabitants and they destroyed the city by fire in very short order. And again, we look at it and say, wow, what a miracle. And we just mentioned a while ago, you know, in light of the solar eclipse, the, the miracle, how, how crazy it was these Amorites were, were fighting against the nation of Israel. And they could not, uh, in that day, they would have never defeated in, in that one single day before the sun set all of those armies and those kings. And, and so what did God do? He just held the sun at its peak so that the nation of Israel had plenty of time to, to fight every battle and all the five kings that they were against that day and the waves of waves of armies that came against them. But even more cooler than that, uh, the Bible says that, that the Lord killed more Amorites that day than the children of Israel did by the sword. Did you ever read that passage? The Bible says that God uh, slung down hailstones upon their heads and killed them from the heavens, and He killed more than the children of Israel did with the sword. It was a, it was a mighty miracle of, of, of victory. And I'm sure for many, many years to come that that the people of Israel talked about that day as they looked up into the heavens and realized that the Lord, Jehovah, had rained down in fire to win that victory in that single day. Many miracles of the Bible. Uh, I mean, uh, of this time frame in the Bible. Well, look at verse 1 again. According to our, our text in verse 1, you read through that as, as I speak, it, it would seem that all they needed to do was walk in and, and start the war, right? Man, these people had heard all about the Lord and man, their hearts were melting. They were in awe and fear of, of Jehovah God and because of everything that had happened. And you would think, okay, well, there's no need for anything else to be done before the battles. But yet, 
what took place before these things, before the mighty miracles of God, before crossing Jordan, before one battle took place, there was some keys to victories that had to be accomplished before they celebrated. Last week, Brother Carl preached from Joshua 3 and verse 5 where the Bible says that, that Joshua told them to consecrate themselves before the Lord. He said, for tomorrow you will see great and glorious wonders, right? And it was that, that next day when the river Jordan ceased to, to roll and they were able to walk across on dry ground. But, but that verse, consecrating oneself, it was the key to crossing over the Jordan. Look at your neighbor and say, it was the key. Consecrating oneself, it was the the key in their lives to crossing over uh, the River Jordan. And you say, well, what does it mean to consecrate yourself? Well, it means confessing sin, asking for forgiveness, for cleansing, for all the wrong in your life, seeking to correct those things. Joshua literally called the, the children of Israel to, make their, to go before the Lord and make their hearts right before Him. And so it was a, a time of consecration. Oh, the, the Hebrew word, if you were in small groups last Sunday night, in Kaldash, it means clean, dedicated, purified, and watch. This younger generation of the Lord's people, man, they wanted to see God do great things. They really did. They wanted His name to be glorified and honored and, and, and His power to be renowned in all of, of the earth. They wanted the Canaanites to be in awe of their God. They were unlike the, the older generation before them that just refused to go into the, the land of Canaan. In chapter 2, Rahab told the spies that had came in, if you read that passage, you know what I'm talking about. But Rahab told the spies that the Canaanites knew that the Lord, He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. And watch this, our focus verse this past week. Once they crossed Jordan, all the people of the land were in awe of what God had done, according to chapter 4, verse 24, so that all the peoples of the earth, this is why God did what He did, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and that you may be in awe of the Lord your God forever. And so they consecrated. They, consec they consecrated themselves before the Lord and before the battles. Wow. That was the key to crossing over Jordan. It was the key to, to every victory they had. But now you come to chapter 5. In what probably is the most awkward passage in the book of Joshua. And if you've been around me long enough, you know we don't run from these passages. <laughs> but man, awkward occasion that teaches us in our day right here, right now. It's probably one of the oldest truths in the Bible. One of the earliest principles that, that God required of His children, the circumcision of Hebrew males. And this had to happen before the battle as well, didn't it? I want you to see three things from the text we've learned. First of all, verse 2, I want to talk about the practice the practice of circumcision. In verse 2, the Lord instructed Joshua uh, to have all the males circumcised before they went into the land. Boy, what an announcement that was. Hey! Hey, y'all gather around. Everybody get them a sharp knife. If you ain't got one, get some flint and grind it down. You need a sharp knife. What for, Joshua? Well, we're going to circumcise all of y'all. What? <laughs> Yeah, come on over here to the heel of the foreskin and we're going to circumcise you. I'm sure there was some people looking at each other like, you know, we're really going to do this. Joshua said we're going to do it because God said we're going to do this. Well, well, that was the practice. You say, well, where did the practice come from? Well, you might recall. I mean, we just got done with the book of Acts back in the spring. You remember in Acts chapter 14, 15, boy, there was a huge controversy going on, wasn't there? 
Man, people were getting saved right and left, and, and there were Jewish people being saved, and there were Gentiles being saved, and there's this huge argument. Hey, shouldn't the Gentiles be required to keep the law in order to be completely righteous before God? Should they not be required to be circumcised? Y'all remember that? So they had this big meeting in Jerusalem. And all the apostles came together and they talked about that matter. And the, the result of that meeting was simply this. No works of the law. No works of the law will justify man before God. Only through faith in Christ can one be saved. And that means that the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised. And all the Gentile brothers went, woo, 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 woo. I joke, but that's what happened. And you remember that context. You say, well, where did it start? Well, you go back to Genesis 17. The time of the Abrahamic covenant when, when God told Abraham, hey, I'm going to use you to be the father of all the nation of Israel. I'm going to bless you and, and I'm going to multiply your seed. There's going to be so many little Abrahams. You remember that song, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. You remember that song. He said, there's going to be so many of you, it's going to be like the, the, the number of grains of sands on the, on the beaches. There's going to be so many uh, sons of Abraham. It's going to be like the stars in the sky. They're going to be all over the world. But Abraham, there's going to be something different about these people. Well, what is that, God? Well, I want you to circumcise every male in your family. I want a distinction about you among the face of, on, on the face of the earth among all people everywhere. And so Abraham, from the beginning of time, circumcised every male. And that became the custom of the Hebrews going forward. Later, Moses included it in the law of the Lord in Leviticus 12, 3, that every male would be circumcised on the what? The eighth day of its life. And you remember that uh, Jesus was brought to the temple with Mary and Joseph in Luke chapter 2, verse 21, and, and they circumcised him on the eighth day to fulfill the law. Wow. Well, why did they do this? Well, other than the fact that God had told them, why did they, why was this the practice? Well, number one, letter A, there was a physical reason. Well, the minor surgery cut away flesh that could hold disease that would be passed on to their wives. And it was important for the preservation of God's people physically and the containment of disease in their midst. Well, you know it was a different time, right? Completely different era of the world in, in which there were no medicines and antibiotics for such things. They just weren't available. And so therefore, God made it a precaution in the law for that very reason. There was a physical reason. But number two, letter B, there was a spiritual reason for this. Yeah. Now listen carefully. All through the Scripture, you say, man, that, this is the weirdest and most awkward Scripture that you could read. I mean, really, Pastor, right before lunch. <laughs> there was a spiritual reason. Listen carefully. All through Scripture, we know that there is more to this subject than just the physical aspect of circumcision. In the time in which Israel had rebelled against God, for instance, and worshipped idols for a number of years, God used the symbolism of circumcision to confront them about it. You look it up in Jeremiah chapter 4, uh, when they had been an idolatrous people. Jeremiah said to them, literally, you need to have your heart circumcised. Man, why in the world did he say that? Man, every Hebrew male understood circumcision. And when God said, there's a problem with your heart, it needs to be circumcised. There, there's a part of you in your heart and your life that needs to be cut off and cut out. Wow. Pretty strong words. Pretty strong imagery. And I might add that that uh, part of the problem in the nation of Israel at that time was sexual immorality in the name of idol worship. 
And how appropriate that God would say of the sexual organ of the male, because you're so perverted, there's something that needs to be cut out of your life. Your lives don't honor me at all and certainly doesn't worship me. It was in that period of time that God began to associate that part of the flesh and the cutting off of it with the sins of the nation of Israel. And throughout time, alluding to the fact that there was a portion of their hearts that was not right before Him. And later, when Paul began to write his epistles in Romans chapter 2, verse 29, he wrote that the followers of the Lord were to be circumcised of the heart. Watch me. Not by the letter of the law. I mean, hey, a lot of people could follow different portions of the law and say, oh, I'm right with the law. Didn't they do that? They did exactly that. There were so many Pharisees that, that would, would say, man, I am so right with the law. I, I'm so right. I even tithe of all the little mints and cumin and all the little things in my life. I'm so perfectly right with God. But yet, Paul said, hey, it, you may fulfill some of the letter of the law, but there's something wrong with your heart. You may be circumcised in the flesh, but you're not circumcised in the heart. And that doesn't take place by the law, by fulfilling it. It takes place, Romans chapter 2, verse 29, Paul said, by the Spirit of God within you. And the truth was that, that the old man in the heart needed to be cut away. And we should be governed not by the law, but by the Spirit of God within us. Not by the flesh, but by the transformation of Christ within. And so there it was, the practice. Yes, there was a physical reason. But more so God in, embedded that truth and that practice into their culture to teach them something spiritual down the line. And so there's the practice. Well, number two, uh, in our text, you'll notice there was a problem. The Bible says that none of the children of Israel, and I'm paraphrasing, all, none of the males in Israel who were born in the wilderness, had been circumcised. Forty years worth. So I'm sure there were a number of, there was over, a, some scholars estimate that there was a million point two people that crossed the Jordan River. And watch me, that's a lot of folks. You, you, you hearing me? <laughs> that's a lot of folks. Considering the fact that the old generation, except Joshua and Caleb, had died off. Man, those folks were procreating out in that wilderness. I'll never forget my daddy preaching on that passage, and he said, you know, man, some million-something people crossing the, the Jordan. Everybody thinks they were miserable out in the wilderness. Well, obviously, they weren't always miserable. <laughs> they procreated the entire time. And here they were, who knows how many hundreds and thousands of young men who were ready to obey you say, whoo, I bet they wasn't ready to obey that one. Well, guess what? In chapter 1, when God put the mantle of leadership on, on Joshua, they stood up and they said, hey, Joshua, whatever you tell us to do, we're going to do it. And wherever you tell us to go, we're going to go. They said it. And guess what? There's no argument in chapter 5 about this matter of circumcision. They did it. They brought themselves into obedience with the Word of God. But, but watch me, uh, they, the old generation who had died off, this was where the problem lied. Man, they had refused to go into the, the land of Canaan. They had disobeyed the, the direct orders of the Lord, and as the text reveals, as a result of that, hey, God said, you're not going into the promised land. In fact, you can just die in your misery out here in the wilderness. But now this younger generation, I'm going to let them come into the land of Canaan. And boy, they were disobedient. You, you, get a, you get a proper understanding of how disobedient they were because they had not only refused to go into the land of Canaan, but they laxed in fulfilling the law. Completely disobedient to what Moses had freshly written on Mount Sinai by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, right? 
And they discontinued. And when God had said in Genesis chapter 17 to Abraham, this one thing in your midst I want you to do to set yourself apart, being distinct as a people on the face of the earth that belong to me, this one thing and this generation, watch me, had refused to do the fundamental first commandment of the Lord to Abraham that would set them apart and distinct them as be being the people of God. They refused to do it, and that entire generation was uncircumcised. So it wasn't so much a physical thing with God as it was, you have refused as my people to identify with me distinctively on the face of the earth as I have had you to do throughout all of your history. Now you think about that. Over 400 years in bondage in Egypt, they had maintained the practice and custom of the Hebrew people. But in just short order in the time of the wilderness, 40 years, 10% of the time that they were in bondage, when they weren't even underneath the, the tyrannical rule of the Pharaoh, <laughs> they just refused to obey God. That was the problem. Their hearts were distinctly uh, unsubmissive and insubordinate to God, directly disobedient. And it's little wonder that God refused to let that generation go into the promised land. Their hearts were far from God. In verse 8, I want you to notice something. Hey, I want to I ask you, and I, I'm, I guess i got to pick on Byron here just a little bit. Aren't y'all glad Byron made it today? <laughs> Hugh, yeah, y'all give him a hand. We're glad you're here. <laughs> made your hip surgery 10 days ago or so, and here he is. Praise the Lord. Well, Byron, that surgery hurt, didn't it? There's been moments that you've probably been in pretty, pretty good pain despite the use of proper medicines over there that Miss Vanessa could pres prescribe for you. Well, surgery's painful, ain't it? What does verse 8 say? Just, just read it real quickly. I'm not being crude when I say this. The Scripture says this. Them old boys were in a lot of pain. They were. They were in a lot of pain. But they were willing to go through this physical surgery that brought pain, and then the Bible says that they remained where they were at until they were healed. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But not only do you need to look at verse 8 as a key principle for your life, but verse 9. After the fact, the Lord said, I have rolled... Carl, I did this just for you. This is King James. I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Wow. You are no longer disdained and mocked for the fact that you are wandering around directionless because of your disobedience. After they consecrated themselves and, and circumcision was accomplished and obedience was reestablished, God announced through Joshua, I am ready to bless you. I've rolled away your reproach and the curse that has been on you for all of these many years that you wandered around. I'm ready to bless you. Now having said that, I want us to look at some principles. Number three, some principles from this Old Testament awkward story. Look at your neighbor and just say, man, this is awkward. <laughs> yeah, you think it's awkward for you? You ought to be the one preaching it. <laughs> Told my dad yesterday, he said, what you preaching tomorrow? I said... Circumcision. He said, oh, that's always a blessing. <laughs> I told the guys this morning, I said, in all of my 28, almost 29 years of ministry, I don't think I've ever preached on circumcision. But here it is, and God said, are you going to ignore that passage? I said, yes, Lord. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> In fact, David Sluter texts me when we soaked through that passage the other day, and he said, man, that passage right there, that's a blessing. <laughs> Read that, them sharp knives, them boys. Boy, man, don't know what to write down in the soap book for that. They were hurting. <laughs> it's right. Don't forget Romans 15, 4. Write that down by that passage. 
Romans, you ought to remember that with all Old Testament texts. Romans chapter 15, verse 4, Paul told the Romans, everything that was written down aforetime was written for you to learn something. So guess what? Here's an Old Testament weirdo, awkward passage, and what in the world are you going to learn from that thing? Well, there's definitely some things to learn. It may be the oddest passage to learn from, but yet there are a few things we need to notice and follow in our own lives. Listen carefully. You don't get anything else, get this. A church doesn't grow. A church will not win battles in the kingdom by simply putting up a building on the corner. Just don't happen. If that was the case, listen folks, all the battles around here would be won. Because they're near about a church everywhere you turn and look. I mean, you throw a rock, it's going to hit one, right? Somebody told me one time, as a brother, why are you planting a church in DeSoto County? There's like 15 million churches there. And I said, well, in every one mile radius, there are 14,000 people. And I said, I don't think any church is reaching 14,000 people. We need some more churches in a densely populated area, right? And here we are, and praise God for it. But, hey, we, we, we don't win battles just by putting up a building on the corner. Listen, if you want to see God work and, and move in our lives, what's the title of the message? <laughs> We're talking about what takes place before the battles. If you want to see God move and work in our lives and, and in the life of our church, may I say bluntly, there are some areas of our lives that need to be cut out before He can work. There's some areas where we need to comply with His will and with His Word before He can work. You say, preacher, are you implying that some of us and maybe all of us, uh, there's some areas that isn't right with the Lord? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Let's start right here in the pulpit. There's, there's areas that probably need to be cut out of my life. There's areas that need to be cut out of your life in order for some things to take place. The old man, the flesh that corrupts, causes problems. That circumcision, the practical, physical reason for circumcision was because of the development of diseases and infection. I want to tell you, the old man is contagious. And he's infected. And he has a problem. And if you don't cut him out, there's going to be problems. You say, what, what do you mean cut him out? You know, this, Paul even goes and gets so bold to say that you ought to mortify the members of your body. You remember that text? Colossians chapter 3 verse 5. He said, hey, you need to cut off from your life the things which are dishonoring to the Lord. And literally the, the imagery there that Paul writes with is tied to and alludes to the circumcision of the Hebrew custom. Hey, it's time to, to mortify the flesh, to cut it off, to kill it, so that God can begin to let the blessings flow in your life. Man, they were in the land of milk and honey, weren't they? But before the bat, before Jericho and the walls fell and before the sun stood still and all of the miracles took place, God said, I want my people consecrated and I want them to come into obedience to His Word. This circumcision deal is going to take place before I bless you. Wow. And just as Israel could not go in battles and win battles uh, for the Lord in Canaan without consecrating their, themselves before the Lord, even so if we are to see lives changed in our midst. And there's a time, should be a time for consecration. There should be a time of, of circumcision. Let me ask you a question. How long has it been since you spent time before the Lord? Intentionally wanting your life consecrated. How long has it been since you set aside an hour, a day, where you just said, I want to get before the Lord and say this, like the psalmist said, Psalm 139, 23, 24, the psalmist said, Search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. 
See if there are any grievous ways in me. And Lord, lead me to the way everlasting. Well, that's a prayer that, that says what? It says to the Lord, show me anything in my life that doesn't belong here. You remember that video where the, the guy was getting things chiseled off to him. Come on, Lord, just show me. It's going to be painful. Show me anything that doesn't belong, that hinders me from being the Christian. I need to be. And sometimes we walk around blind to the fact that something in our lives is complete sin and that sin is preventing us from fully serving Him and seeing God do a work that only He can do. How long has it been since you said to the Lord, take out your sharp knife and start cutting? You're the great physician. Lay me down. Start cutting, God. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> well, that was painful for them. Yes, it was. Verse 8 says, After they were circumcised, they had to stay in their place until they were healed. There's a spiritual application there, folks. When you come before the Lord and you say, Search me. Listen. Try me. See if there's some way in me that needs to be removed. I want to tell you something. It's painful. It's painful. When the Holy Spirit of, the, of, of, of God begins to say, that right there. I've been telling you that for years. And you've ignored me. It's time for you to cut that out of your life. It's time for you to grow up. To mature. To repent, I want to say something. Repentance that isn't painful isn't repentance at all. When one truly repents and, and removes something from their life, I want to tell you something. The, the flesh struggles and argues against God. When you start cutting on the flesh, it hurts. It wants to live. It wants to dominate your life. And it starts belly aching and complaining and saying, I don't want to die. And the Spirit conflicts with it, right? Galatians 5, 16, that when you walk in the Spirit, you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh, but the flesh is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit is contrary to the flesh. The flesh argues with the Spirit and says, Oh, no, I'm, I want to have it uh, the, my way. And God says, No, I'm going to cut you out of this situation. It's painful. Don't be surprised when the old flesh argues and, and doesn't want to do what God wants. It's painful. It's when we're broken before Him that we begin to see Him heal us and prepare us to be used. By the way, real quick, another principle of verse 8. I get it. I've seen it a hundred different times where people get humble before the Lord. The Lord does a work in their life. They repent. They're cleansed. They're purified. They're consecrated before the Lord. And the next thing they want to do is say, hey, what can I do now for the Lord? That's exciting, isn't it? I want to tell you something. There's a time of healing, isn't it? You say, well, how, how is that healing come? It comes by the, the spending some time with the great physician. Uh, I'm going to tell you, Byron is doing well, and we praise the Lord for it. But I guarantee you, after the, they cut on him, they're not ready to turn him loose the next day. In fact, I hear he's going to be, like, grounded till 2024. <laughs> That's what it feels like, right, Byron, when you're a go-getter, an independent guy after surgery? No, there's a time of healing. And, and God teaches us there in verse 8, you're going to have to heal here for a while before you can do something for me. By the way, the Word is going to cut you, right? The Word's part of that cutting in the process. Hebrews 4.12 says that the Word of God is, is quicker, and come on, help me, and sharper than any two-edged sword. And that chisel will get on us and cut us, and, and you know what? The Holy Spirit, the Word of God is, is the sword that cuts us, the knife that cuts us and, and, and divides the Spirit and says that's wrong and that's right and this goes and that stays. Watch me. And the Holy Spirit 
is always typified by oil in the scriptures. You know, in the Old Testament and in Bible times, after they cut on you, guess what they do? They take some healing oil and apply it to the wounds. You know, when God's word cuts on you, it hurts, it's sharp. But then the Holy Spirit comes in and says, it's going to be okay. This was my work. I, I did this to you because I'm trying to do something through you. And you know, the video said it's a process. Remember that? He said, this is a process. You know, as a believer, you should be having minor surgeries in your life all the time. Your heart should be circumcised a lot. Do you notice the play on words? When Joshua was told by, uh, by the Lord to circumcise, it says, tell them that we're going to circumcise the children of Israel again. Now, that doesn't mean that the ones who had already been circumcised had to get circumcised again. You know what I'm saying? No, the principle there is every generation and all through time, these people were being circumcised. That was the call of the Scripture. And in every part and era of your life and all through time, God calls you to be circumcised again. Circumcised of the heart. Well, there it is. And then notice what the Scripture says. Verse 9, when, when Joshua announced for the Lord, hey, your, you have been, your reproach has been rolled back. It's gone. I'm getting ready to bless you. I want to tell you something, friend. When you begin to be cut on by the Lord and, and you repent and your life begins to be consecrated before God, He heals you and then He says, I've got something for you to do. It's time to do something. I have removed the shame. You know, a lot of people, you know what I have come to discover? Our theme this year is I serve. You know why a lot of people don't serve? Because they're too ashamed to serve. They don't feel worthy enough to serve. You see, you ought not stay where you're at. You ought to submit to the Word and let it cut on you and change you so that you can be prepared to be used by God. And you won't be ashamed. And the Scripture says your reproach will be rolled away. And some of you, you've been wandering around through the wilderness of your life, directionless, problems abounding, things not happening spiritually in your life, and you look across at somebody else and say, why is it them and not me? Well, because the Lord has some cutting to do on you. Come on up, man. So what does the Lord need to, do, to cut out in your life? What does the Lord need to cut out in your life? You know, there's a story in every chair here. I know some of you are sitting here going, man, my life is so messed up. I've got so many things that need to be changed. I, I don't even belong in this building. Oh, hogwash. Quit letting the devil tell you that. Every single one of us from the pulpit to the very last row of chairs has a struggle with the flesh. We always do. And it's a lifetime of struggles wherein we submit and we surrender and we get under the surgeon's knife. But listen to these scriptures, one Old Testament. What does the Lord need to cut out of your life? This is what God said in Deuteronomy 36. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all of thine heart, with all of thy soul. You know why some of you won't let the Lord cut on you? Because you love your sin more than you love the Lord. Paul said this, Colossians 2, 11, In Christ you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. As a believer then, Paul is saying, your life has been changed already, but there's an ongoing process of letting God remove things out of your life. Would you bow your heads where you're at? So what does God need to cut out of your life? 
What private sin has infected your life and hinders you from being useful to Him? Hinders you from winning battles in your life, from having victory? Maybe it's the sin of pride in your life, comparing yourself to others. Maybe it's the sin of anger in your heart, mad at the things you can't control or other people, jealousy. Maybe it's your mouth. You lie, you curse, you gossip. Your days are filled with things that dishonor Him with your tongue. Maybe it's laziness. You haven't done a thing for God in weeks and months or years. Maybe it's lust. Sexually, you allow temptation and sin into your heart and mind. Maybe it's money. Your money isn't the Lord's. It's yours and you're stingy with it and selfish with it and you've never had enough of it because you don't obey. Maybe it's your mind. The things that you think are so shameful. If people knew it, you'd be, you'd be so floored for them to know. Oh, I could go on and on with examples. Maybe it's unforgiveness towards somebody else. A friend, a co-worker, a family member, your spouse. A lot of things God needs to cut out. But the Holy Spirit, whatever it is, the Holy Spirit is capable of bringing up things in your life that He wants you to cut out. So if you want God to use you, if you want the battles to be won, you've got to be willing to go through the painful process so that you can see the victory down the road. So I'm going to ask you today in this time of invitation for you to come to the altar and, and, and say, God, start cutting on my heart. Circumcise my heart, God.